In this video, I'm going to talk about variables because they are so important in software. I don't want to get too technical, so I'm going to use the idea of Lego blocks and light switches to demonstrate how variables work. Before I go too far, there is one very important idea that you must understand. All variables are the grammatical equivalent of a noun. A noun is simply a person, place, or a thing. It's one of the most widely overlooked concepts, yet it does surprise many intermediate programmers when they make that realization. But fundamentally, it is something that all programmers need to understand. We will talk about why this is such an important concept in another video when we start making our own classes. One thing to consider is that all variables consist of four things. It doesn't matter which language you're programming in, but they all generally follow this basic structure. All variables are composed of four things. A type, or data type, a name, an address, and a value. I'm going to hold off now and not talk about a variable's address, because it's far too important as it relates to something called a pointer. When we get to the subject of pointers, my goal is to make that as easy as possible for you to understand. For a moment, I'd like to focus on the variable data type. In C++, there are four very common data types that we use, and they are an integer, a float, a double, and finally, a character, or char for short. While those may be the most common data types, there is in fact two other categories that types divide into. The first one is a fundamental type. And there you also have integers, floating point types, and void types. Next, you have compound types, which is pointer types, references, enumerations, arrays, and classes. The compound type is the most exciting data type that we have in C++. In fact, it is the foundation of object-oriented programming because here we get to actually create our own data types out of all the other types that are available to us. But for now, we're just going to look at a simple integer. If you ever had an opportunity to use a microcomputer, such as an Arduino, you'll understand that the entire computer itself is just a series of on and off switches. They act the same way as a light switch in your house. And that introduces us to the topic of binary. As you may know, binary is just one or zero, or put another way, on and off. And again, you could say true or false, but at the end of the day, they always evaluate to just on or off. And your program is turning billions of very tiny switches on or off. And as you'll see, it is the combination of on and off that has meaning for your computer. It is much more complicated than that, but I think the best way to demonstrate that is to look at an integer variable type as a little piece of Lego. In this Lego, you've got eight dots on the Lego, and that represents a byte. And each one of those little dots is representative of a bit. And putting eight of them together actually forms a byte. When we put four of those bytes together, that produces the same amount of space that we need for an integer. By looking at the numbers of each byte, which is eight bits long, we see that they further subdivide and it's the combination of bits, either turned on or off, that produces a stored value. What's important to know is that each of the bytes doubles from the previous bit. Starting at one, they double until they get to the very end of the eight bits to equal 128. And when you add all of those bits together, they finally equate to the number 255. As a side thought, this is exactly the way your current IP address on your home computer is set up. Let's look at a live example. Let's say we have a variable with an integer type called pot of gold, and it has a value of 100. Another important thing to understand is that you may not always need to set or initialize your value to anything, but rest assured, it actually is holding a value of some kind, whether you set it or not. We could have left pot of gold without a value in this case, but we didn't. As you know, this particular variable 
has each of the four components that every variable has. It has a name, a type. Let's put this into a Lego context. Here you see we have a four byte integer, which is also 32 bits. By turning on the bits, we can manipulate what we store inside the integer. As you can see here from all of those bits, we've only turned on the third, sixth, and seventh bit inside the first byte of our integer. By doing so, that equates to a value of 100. You may be asking yourself what happens to the rest of the bits in those remaining three bytes. Well, there's a lot of memory that does go unused. Those bits will not be used, unfortunately. But we are in an age of terabytes of data, so I don't think we're going to run out anytime soon. But for now, I just want you to understand that that's the basis of how a variable is used and what are the four components of a variable. Let's quickly look at one more example, if only to illustrate that variables come in different bytes and bits. As mentioned, a character, or char, is one of our previous data types. Take the variable char letter equals a. It has a name, a type, a value, and an address. We can see the char in two forms. As a single character in quotes around the letter a, or numerically expressed as a numbered representation of a letter, and without the quotes. Seeing it in a numeric form is from ASCII, which is nothing to worry about right now. In either form, you should take note of the fact that the char is only one byte as compared to the other types, like a four byte integer, or even an eight byte float, or eight byte double. There's one more thing that I want to discuss with you, and that's the role of the compiler. How do we go from writing software code, also called source code, and somehow translating that into billions upon billions of ones and zeros? The answer is, it's your compiler. It's actually an operating system itself that translates your human written text language, or source code, into machine language that your computer can understand and manipulate. So in essence, your compiler takes a set of program instructions or inputs from your software and then converts that into a set of instructions into a different set of machine instructions. We refer to the resulting output from the compiler as binary code. Once we've compiled our program, we don't need to keep recompiling unless we change the original source code. In the next video, what I want to do is look at the overall construction of a C++ program. I think now that we understand what variables are, it's time to introduce the actual construction of our first program, and from there we can dissect all of the moving parts that are involved. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.